Hello. When most people think about 40k, they probably think about Space Marines. When those people think about cool Space Marines, they definitely think about Terminators. And there is one game that shows those terrific Termies at their slow walking, lightning clawing, gene stealer fighting finest. A game so good that they just keep making it. Every now and again. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today we're scanning for the origins of Space Hulk. For many, this is the tabletop equivalent of the movie Aliens, Warhammer 40,000's first dungeon dive, a cinematic thrill ride that features some of the most iconic heroes and villains in the setting. And based on the quality of the product, it should be no surprise that this two-player classic has remained a firm favourite amongst the GW faithful for many years. Space Hulk is a game of desperate combat between man and alien. Fought across a maze-like map of interlocking car tiles, one player takes on the role of the Space Marine Terminators, the Imperium's finest warriors, clad in nigh-indestructible tactical dreadnought armour. The second player controls the Gene Stealers, a formidable Xenos monster armed with razor-sharp claws, phenomenal speed and ferocious strength. The Terminators have entered a derelict hulk, an agglomeration of ruined ships, asteroids and celestial debris, drifting through space and inhabited by creatures from another world. Even the mighty Terminators will suffer if the Gene Stealers get close enough. They'll peel open that armour like a tin of space sardines. The Terminators carry a ton of firepower, but they are slow and outnumbered. The Gene Stealers are only effective in close combat, but there's a near infinite supply of them and the marines don't always know where they are. This game is a ticking time bomb of supreme space stress. Sure, it is heavily skewed against the marine players, but for many that's what makes this even more fun. After all, there is a reason that this game is so highly regarded in GW's history, even after all this time. Now, before we launch the boarding tubes and start scanning for blips, why don't you give this video a like? It's what the Emperor would want. Or the Patriarch if you're on that side of the game. Space Hulk was first released in 1989 and was designed by Richard Halliwell, known to his friends as Hal. One of the earliest inklings of this impending game came a few months before it came out. White Dwarf 112 featured a small news snippet, explaining that Paul Murphy was now editing the game, and there was even a photo of Halliwell and Murphy playtesting it. Murphy would also be credited in the rulebook for additional material that he provided during the game's development. And together with HAL, they produced quite the package. And whilst news of this impending Space Hulk was noteworthy enough, issue 112 had something even more important to announce. The arrival of the Space Marine Terminators. The first Terminators were sculpted by Jez Goodwin and Bob Naismith between 1987 and 88, with the first public appearances turning up in White Dwarf. In issue 110, the relationship between Terminator and Gene Stealer had been established, and with that issue 112, the full Terminator squad was revealed. This box of eight metal miniatures was designed by Jez Goodwin, and marks the culmination and refinement of the prototype designs that he and Naismith had been working on. After the slightly different stylings of the prototypes, this new design for Terminator armour would form the basis of what would become known as the Indomitus pattern, and the lore also begins to take shape here too. Tactical Dreadnought armour is described as being worn by veteran marines for use in confined spaces and close quarter combat, and those Terminators had arrived in the 41st millennium just in time, because sighted at the edge of the galaxy was something terrifying, a space hulk a drifting mass of derelict ships fused together by the vagaries of the warp, and potentially home to both incredible lost technologies and dangerous Xenos foes. In May 1989, White Dwarf's 113th issue previewed the new Space Hulk game, showing off the art and components that you would find within it. There was also a brief but effective bit of storytelling, told in intermittent comms and bits of flavour text this would go on to be a hallmark of the Space Hulk game. Light touch, but cinematic storytelling that lets the imagination and memories of your favourite movies fill in the blanks. 
The issue also advertised the availability of the Space Hulk demo games being run at the upcoming Games Day by designer Richard Halliwell himself. Space Hulk was released in a classic GW big box, featuring cover art by Jerry Grace. Grace was a phenomenally talented artist working primarily in genre fiction, and later Magic the Gathering. He was responsible for book covers, such as this incredible work for Frank Herbert's Dune, and this one for The Enemy Within. No, a different enemy and a different within. Grace didn't appear to work with GW for long, but whilst he did, he produced some amazing pieces, like this one called Fists of Death. There was more incredible art on the mountain of floor tiles in the box. These depicted the interior corridors and rooms of the Space Hulk, beautifully illustrated by Gary Chalk. There's no credit for the floor tiles in the main game, but Chalk, who famously illustrated another GW classic, the magical quest game Talisman, and who would later leave GW to, amongst other things, create Lone Wolf with Joe Diva, confirmed to me that he did draw all of the tiles for the first edition of the game, including those for its expansions and White Dwarf articles. He even mentioned that he completed some tiles that never ended up being used, including one that had a huge battery of guns on rails. He had imagined it as being something of a Guns of Navarone style scenario. And these floor plans are one of the great strengths of the game. As with Advanced Hero Quest, also released in 1989, the game board isn't static. Instead, these modular tiles are assembled by their jigsaw ends, making up a map as indicated by the mission that you're playing. There's also a host of tokens in the box to help you manage your turns, conceal your forces, create doorways, and indicate objectives. And of course, there are miniatures. The box included 20 plastic gene stealers and 10 plastic terminators. These plastic termies took their design cues from the new metal squad with near identical helmets. But there were some differences, particularly in the shoulder pads, which are reminiscent of those earlier test marines that Goodwin had previously sculpted. The Gene Stealers took a slightly different route to the game, though. They first appeared as a Xenos threat in Rogue Trader, and they already had their alien mythology homage in place. But they looked different, and there are some slight inconsistencies with what we would see in Space Hulk. Rogue Trader Gene Stealers are purported to originate on a planet called Imgral, and were described as a native species that had leech-like mouths. The bestiary entry mentions concepts like the implantation of eggs in host organisms, and the adoption of those host species characteristics, even going so far as to suggest that a fourth generation gene stealer from consistent human hosts would actually look like a human, although they would have bluish tinged skin and vampiric teeth. In fact, more is made of this vampiric parallel in the book, an idea that would be retained if somewhat diluted over subsequent appearances. New metal pure strain and hybrid gene stealers had been advertised at the back of White Dwarf 113, but it wouldn't be until the following issues that the background for these miniatures was really explored. In part one of two articles, White Dwarf 114 would provide updated lore for the gene stealers in this new form, ready to make them suitable foes for the new Space Marine Terminators and start increasing the frequency of their appearances in the 40k universe. Written by Paul Murphy, editor and development support on Space Hulk, the article speaks in detail about gene stealer cults the slow infection of Imperium worlds, and the use of Space Hulks as a space-borne viral carrier vessel. It also mentions the events that transpired on the Space Hulk Death of Integrity, successfully cleared of a Gene Stealer infestation by Marines of the Blood Drinkers and Nova Marines chapters, at a 50 to 1 casualty ratio, as depicted in Mike McVeigh's stunning diorama, a story which would later be told more fully in the 2013 novel Death of Integrity by Guy Haley. And long before that book would be released, the Space Hulk box included two books of its own, a rules book and a mission and background book. The rulebook opens with a suitably immersive after-action report that makes for grim reading for the marine player. A Blood Angel's company is decimated after encountering overwhelming odds in the bowels of a Space Hulk. Getting to the objective was simple enough, but the marines just couldn't kill enough of the enemy for every casualty that they took, and the Xenos just kept coming. Deploying in multiple tactical squads, using flamers, destroying doors, and monitoring enemy movements are all called out in the story as effective strategies and close combat is correctly identified as far too risky. The enemy is more than a match for even a Terminator, but the real concern is that there may just be too many of them to make victory possible. 
it sets the tone for what will be a fierce battle, although it's one that will play relatively simply. Marines each have four action points, with which they can move and maneuver, shoot, open and close doors, go on overwatch, or clear a jammed weapon. And boy, will you need to clear some jams. The sublime frustration of an inconvenient gun jam would cause many a marine player to rage to the high heavens. Luckily, in space, no one can hear you scream. Once all of the marines are done with their actions, the gene stealer player then gets to move their blips, counters that represent movement on the space marine scanners of an unknown type and volume. On the underside of these blip tokens, there would be a number showing how many gene stealers it represented. It could be a horde or just a lone monster, and the marine player wouldn't find out until it entered their line of sight and the gene stealer miniatures were placed on the board instead. Blips and revealed gene stealers move far more more quickly than a Terminator, and so they have six action points, but with no ranged weaponry, they'll need every single one of them. Their only choice is to get into combat with the Marines quickly and efficiently. And combat is brutal. When shooting, Marines kill a gene stealer only on a score of six, rolling 2d6, but sustained fire on the same target over a couple of actions makes it easier to kill it. If you're in Overwatch, then you get to shoot at gene stealers that move into your line of sight even during their turn, but you don't get sustained fire bonuses, and any roll of a double jams your gun and you can't fire it again until you've spent an action to clear it. That is beautiful, man. Oh man, that just beats it all. In close combat, each player rolls their dice and the highest score wins. Gene Stealers roll three dice, Marines roll only one. Combat was brutal, but it had to be, because that is where the tension comes from. There were a few other rules like flamers and command points and Space Marine Captain bonuses in combat, stuff like that, but it was relatively simple overall. What made it so exciting was the fact that those Marines could just get destroyed with a single bad dice roll, and there was a limited number of them. But for the Gene Stealers, well, it felt like they just kept coming. There was an onslaught on the way, and you had a job to do. In the mission book, you would find six scenarios set aboard the Space Hulk, the Sin of Damnation. Despite knowing that there were tens of thousands of Gene Stealers in cryostasis on that Hulk, the Marines are intent on boarding the vessel because they want to reclaim the Dark Age technology that they think it will contain and they have a plan to help them do it. Whilst only a small number of Steelers are currently awake and fighting, the Marines plan to make their way through the Hulk and introduce a toxin into the cryo systems, wiping out the as yet unthawed Gene Steelers. But even with most of them still asleep, there are a great many Xenos between the Marines and their target. The scenarios taken together tell a story that attempts to balance the gameplay experience giving the Marine player specific objectives to achieve and the Gene Stealer player the tools to overwhelm and stop them. Today, the game is still cited as a classic of GW game design, but it cannot be denied that the fun factor does skew somewhat towards the Marine player. They just have more options and more stakes, I guess. And some people who reviewed the game when it first came out had similar thoughts. Games International editor and reviewer Brian Walker gave Space Hulk 2 out of 5 stars, expressing some concern over the design of the game. The problem here is play balance, the element in a game where both players have an even chance at the outset. Curiously though, such a notion does not appear to be a problem at Games Workshop. He added that whilst the rulebook is well written and goes a long way to providing a suitable atmosphere for the game, that Halliwell has some way to go before he can be described as a good game designer. The review was pretty scathing, and presumably that had nothing to do with the fact that Games Workshop had not provided a promised review copy to the magazine, which caused them to miss their publication deadline. Walker also miscredited Halliwell as the designer of the recent Chainsaw Warrior game, which was actually created by Stephen Hunt. But none of that really seemed to matter, because the game sold out almost as quickly as a Gene Stealer unwraps a Terminator for an 11 o'clock snack. And other reviews were far more favourable. In Dragon Magazine, Ken Rolston was effusive in his praise. Expensive and elegant components, lovely alien Gene Stealer and Space Marine models, simple systems and exceptionally clear rules, with lots of helpful diagrams, are presented with a fast pace of play and lots of action and mayhem. The Space Hulk game is excellent.
Similarly, in Challenge Magazine issue 43, John Thiessen summarised his feelings on the game. Space Hulk possesses too many tactical subtleties to evaluate, and has the potential for too many new scenarios to design to permit any dust to accumulate on it for very long. Despite its high price, I recommend Space Hulk. Or, to quote an Australian friend of mine, this one's a ripper. I don't know who the Australian friend is, but apparently they were also quoted as saying, <laughs> that's not a power sword. The game won the Origin Award for Best Fantasy or Science Fiction Board Game of 1989. Eventually, even Games International would come around on Space Hulk. Just two issues after their punishing review, they upgraded its score to three stars in their Christmas buying guide. As became the standard for New Games Workshop games, Space Hulk was supported by several articles in White Dwarf, some with more contributions from HAL that were designed to expand the number of options and provide new scenarios for players. The first such article came in White Dwarf 114 and provided a full extra mission that takes place after the campaign in the book. Pitfall was written by Paul Murphy and featured a multi-level map, new rules for vertical line of sight, looking through holes in the floor and up and down ladders, as well as new floor tiles. Other articles introduced librarians and captains, Terminator close combat weapons, army lists so that you could choose your Terminator squads and loadouts, using tactical marines, and even rules for playing as traitor terminators. In time, there would be two new boxed expansions for the game, each offering new options for the combatants, new missions, and new ways to play. The first would be Deathwing, and it could aptly be described with the slogan, this time, there's more. Game design for the Deathwing set is credited to Richard Halliwell and Jervis Johnson, with missions by Dean Bass and Martin Kay. Much of the White Dwarf material for Space Hulk up to this point is incorporated into the box. Deathwing starts off strong by giving Marine players some new toys. Lots of new toys. Assault cannons, grenade launchers, power swords, chain fists, thunder hammers, storm shields, lightning claws, and force axes. The Deathwing definitely play to win. Inside the box, you'd find four Terminators, eight Gene Stealers, counters, blips, mission tiles, and new board sections, including the impressive extra-wide corridors. There were new rules, and an entire new campaign comprising six missions as well. But perhaps the most exciting additions were new options for how you could play the game. A randomised mission generator was included, so that you could play a new scenario every time. You were no longer restricted to the published missions or the ones that you'd made up yourself. Now, you could use the 10 enclosed mini-maps, the so-called geotiles, along with randomly rolled mission parameters. And there were also a set of solo rules that allowed you to automate Gene Stealer actions. These rules were designed to work with any published mission, but they also included a specially created solo mission as well, Cloud Runner's Last Stand. Cloudrunner was the protagonist of a story that was told throughout the pages of the Deathwing rulebook, interspersed amongst the new rules and missions. The story was written by William King and Brian Ansell, and would go on to be reprinted as the title story in the first ever 40k fiction anthology that would be published by GW Books later in 1990. And for those who are interested, we will eventually be reading Deathwing as part of my GW Books Club, where we're reading all 17 of the original books put out by the imprint in their original release order. The second expansion for Space Hulk would do for the Gene Stealer player what Deathwing had done for the Marine player sort of. This time, it would be more about Gene Stealers, but of course, there'd still be new Marines as well. This was called Gene Stealer, an expansion designed by Hal, Matt Forbeck, and Jervis Johnson, with a focus on psychic combat in Space Hulk. When the Librarians had first been added to the game in White Dwarf 114, there had been some simple rules for psychic powers, but this set would dramatically increase their potency and the number of available options. There were new mechanics based around a set of 44 psychic attack cards, allowing psychers to unleash powers like Hellfire, Blast, Teleport, and everyone's favourite sing-along, Warp Time. With all the weapons, psychic powers, and options that had been added to the game, there were also some handy and very intimidating looking reference tables included as well. Gene Stealer also contained 15 new, finely sculpted plastic Citadel miniatures, five marine librarians in Aegeus armour and carrying force axes and nemesis force halberds, along with 10 Gene Stealer hybrids carrying autocannons, conversion beamers and missile launchers. 
the new blip counters that were included in the box would let you field these new hybrids. And they also had another nasty surprise for the Space Marines. There were now blips for deploying up to six Gene Stealers in one go, a far cry from the maximum of three in the base game. There were only two new missions in the box, but they were big, especially the final assault mission, which was obscenely huge. But it wasn't all fun and games for the Gene Stealer player, because the Space Marines had summoned some special support. Now, it wasn't just Blood Angels and Dark Angels taking to the Hulks, the Grey Knights had arrived as well. The Grey Knights are described as so awesomely powerful that they push the current point system to its limits. The best way to include Grey Knights is to design some missions of your own specifically for them, which is a surprising suggestion given that this is the supplement that introduced them to the game. They are equipped with Nemesis Force weapons, which allow them to get a free shot at a Gene Stealer if they draw in combat. And they can also emit a psychic blast at enemies within 12 squares. And the Grey Knight Sergeants are high level psychers with a load of extra bonuses too. There are ideas around balancing out smaller squads of Grey Knights so that the Steelers still have a fighting chance, as well as using more of the bigger blips and taking some of the more dangerous options. But they are definitely a significant shift in the game's balance. There is actually a note at the start of the Grey Knight rules section that reads, we'll be dealing with Grey Knights in far more detail in the future. But so far, and I'm not saying my research is exhaustive, but I have not been able to find these next rules about the Grey Knights. So, Gene Stealer players, be safe out there. The art on the box covers for both Deathwing and Gene Stealer was illustrated by Fangorn, the pen name of Chris Baker, who worked on several other GW titles like Battle for Armageddon, before illustrating the Redwall book series and then becoming a concept and storyboard artist for movies like AI and Skyfall. Following the release of the expansions, there were several more White Dwarf articles, including a number of new missions and campaigns. One of particular note and coolness was White Dwarf 138's campaign set on the hive world of Necromunda. During this period, White Dwarf had been publishing a set of rules for the precursor to the modern Necromunda game, called Confrontation, and it seems likely that this inspired the alternative setting for the missions. Written by Dean Bass and with the gorgeous Gene Stealer cult artwork by Dave Gallagher, the Space Hulk Campaigns book collated and republished the various missions and rules that had so far been released in White Dwarf. The Traitor Marine rules were reprinted so that you could play games of Chaos versus Imperium. The rules for Tactical Marines in Power Armor were also reprinted, in case you really wanted to test your metal against the Gene Stealers by sort of like being your own uber delivery of yourselves. White Dwarf still had a few more missions for the Imperium's finest as well, with campaigns published in issues 142 and 144, one of which featured Marines of the Space Wolf chapter. And there was a little bit more life left in Space Hulk yet, both digitally and in print. The Citadel Journal was revived in 1994, with Gav Thorpe, Mark Hawkins and Ian Pickstock at the helm and a remit to make wild and wonderful rules for any and all GW game systems. From the very first issue, there would be support for Space Hulk, offering up unseen enemy setup rules, new missions and campaigns. And perhaps of the most significant note, there would be rules for Eldar and Harlequins. And you thought a Terminator didn't last very long against a Gene Stealer. Across all of the releases for Space Hulk, there was an enormous volume of incredibly evocative internal art, including work by Tony Ackland, Nick Coleman, Wayne England, Dave Gallagher, Paul Green, Tony Huff, Kevin Walker, Steve Tappin, Richard Wright, Paul Bonner, Fangorn, Jez Goodwin, Gary Harrod, Pete Nifton, Dave Andrews, Ian Miller, John Blanche, and Mark Gibbons. Seriously, this Gibbons piece might be my favourite ever picture of a Terminator. And of course, as ever, it's worth remembering that without the sculptors, in this case Jez Goodwin, Bob Naismith, Dave Andrews and Michael and Alan Perry, there'd be no minis with which we could play. There were of course a great many other individuals who contributed to the creation of the game and its expansions, and they are all owed a debt of gratitude too. In 1993, Electronic Arts would take Space Hulk into a new domain, the digital space. 
EA release a video game adaptation of Space Hulk for PC and Amiga. Unlike Gremlin Interactive, who had made adaptations of Hero Quest and Space Crusade and stayed relatively faithful to the gameplay of the board games, EA wanted to create a game that was inspired by Space Hulk, but really took advantage of PC gaming technology. Looking back at the graphics now, they have something of an old world charm, and the 50 mission campaign offered a lot of value for money. For fear of any legal troubles, I'm not going to show any footage or audio from the game itself, but if you've never heard it, or have forgotten what the voiceovers sounded like, then I have included a link to the intro in the description below. I recommend that immediately after this video, you go remind yourselves what the Dark Angels chapter, Deathwing Company, sounds like. There was a sequel released a few years later, Vengeance of the Blood Angels, which was also by EA and by all accounts was also reasonably good fun. Like the vessels on which the game is based, Space Hulk has a habit of slipping in and out of warp space when you least expect it, and offering up a new, beautiful version of the game every couple of years. There have been two fully revised editions of the game, one in 1996 and one in 2009, and on top of that, an expanded re-release in 2014 and any number of video and card game adaptations as well. I, unfortunately, have noticed that I'm running out of command points, so I've not got time to get into the detail of all of those editions right now. I'm sure though, we will come back to it at some point. Hal's time primarily freelancing at Citadel and Games Workshop had a profound influence on the games and worlds that would push the company on to its enormous creative and commercial successes, as well as co-creating Warhammer with Rick Priestley and supporting its evolution and expansion through subsequent editions and supplements. He also worked on a Judge Dredd game called Blockmania and drove the creation of Dark Future, arguably the forgotten world and core system of GW's past. And yet, in a list of crowning achievements, perhaps the topmost crown belongs to Space Hulk, a game that wears its inspirations on its sleeve and then sweats through its shirt when things get wild, tense and incredibly fun in that desperate battle between man and alien. I think it's well worth remembering the people who have contributed to all of these wonderful worlds and games. We all know that these are collaborative efforts and that no one person is truly responsible for any one product or release from the company. But there have been individuals who have contributed just so much during their time, however brief it may well have been. I think that these games are magnificent, and I think the people who made them have been magnificent too. And I think it's well worth remembering people like Hal, who have delivered for us an incredible experience at the gaming table. I hope that you've enjoyed this scan of the origins of Space Hulk. What was your favourite edition of the game? Do you still think the original is the best, or do you think that the refinements and expansions of the third and fourth edition have elevated those above it? Or do you share my controversial love for the second edition? Why not let me know with a comment down below? Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. What do you think, Martha? Could you take it?